Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 280. Uh, Dr. Matt Barton here. Uh, we're going to pick up with Chapter 2 of the book, where we're going into the games industry, take a look at what this business lo model looks like, and where you might find yourself in it, or where you might like to be, if the games industry is someplace you are eyeing as a career option. Uh, but at any rate, I think it's just interesting to learn how games get made. So the first question I have for you today is to think about some of your favorite video games. So if you have it handy, if you bought it, uh, you could just pick it up and look at it. Uh, otherwise, go to uh, Wikipedia, you know, type in the name of the game, see if you can find the page for it there. Uh, or, and maybe in addition to Wikipedia, go to a site called Moby Games. Just look for Moby Games and you'll find it on, uh, on Google and type in the game there. And see if you can get a sense of how many people were involved in making your game. Was it a small team? Maybe it's just one person. Uh, was it a team of hundreds? You know, get, see if you can get a sense of that. And then also any information you can find about the sales that are generated as well as the profits. Uh, so that information should be on the Wikipedia page somewhere, but just see what you can find uh, and then come back and report. All right, so here's the outline of our talk today. We'll talk a little bit about the size of the game industry. How does it compare to Hollywood? How does it compare to uh, the book trade and novels? Uh, we'll look at the structure of the big game industry. That's really where we're focused on in this lecture. The big so-called AAA games, the Call of Duties, the Halos, the, uh, the uh, Fortnites. Uh, we'll talk a little about the development process the stages the games go through is all the way from the idea phase on to the actual game that you can purchase. Uh, and then we'll look at these different roles in game development. It's not just programmers. You know, obviously there's many different talents, many different uh, uh, skill sets that come to bear on modern games. As they talked about the diversity of the games industry, when I was coming up, the games industry was dominated by a Nintendo and, so, uh, and Sega, rather. And I just thought I'd mention this while I'm thinking about it. Uh, if you are interested in the history of vintage or uh, video game consoles, <laughs> you know, yours truly did co-author a book on the topic called Vintage Games Consoles, uh, where we go back and talk about the Atari 2600, the original Nintendo, the Sega uh, Genesis, the Sega Master System, all that stuff. So. You know, I have written quite extensively on that. I'm not going to uh, bore you with all that here, uh, but just to point that out. But anyway, as I was saying, when I was uh, coming up, it was Nintendo and Sega were basically your two options. And then later on, uh, uh, Sony came onto the scene with the PlayStation, shook things up. And then, of course, uh, the Xbox. So it was Xbox and PlayStation. People thought Nintendo was out. And then Nintendo released a little thing called the Wii, and suddenly they exploded. Uh, and then they did even better with their portable, you know, their handheld devices are still just huge. Uh, so things have shifted up, and they talked a little bit about how the, the PC games, uh, that the authors of our textbook, unfortunately, seemed to be a little negative about, at least I thought they were, about the, the PC games on Steam and, uh, and the Mac. Uh, but I think that's, they probably... Uh, don't give them enough credit. You know, certainly Steam and the Epic Game Store. Uh, you see a lot of uh, game development happening, games m being made for computers again. Uh, and of course, the Apple iPhone, and before that, the iPod actually uh, were again really huge. They really shook things up. And so, anyway, the result of all this is that it's not clear anymore that uh, Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo will continue. They still seem to play a dominant role, especially in these games we're talking about, the big AAA, uh, so-called AAA games. You know, typically if you are the type of gamer that wants to play the latest, greatest, biggest games, uh, you probably do have an Xbox or PlayStation or maybe a Switch at home. Uh, but it's not clear that this will be the future. Like maybe things will, maybe these uh, the, the smartphones will continue to, to evolve to the point where you don't need a console. Uh, but it's certainly the case, too, I think, that you don't have to have a console anymore to enjoy. Not that you ever did, but, I mean, there's there's so much to play on uh, Windows machines and the Mac that 
it's not really all about the consoles anymore, I guess is the, <laughs> the point we're trying to make here. Uh, so I guess on the one hand, there are lots of other opportunities. You know, you could, you, could be a, you could have a great career in the games industry without ever making a product for uh, a PlayStation or an Xbox uh, or a, a Switch, you know, something like that. You could just focus on making iPhone games and do just fine or just make uh, games for the, uh, the Windows machines and be fine. So it's an interesting time. Uh, let's just put it that way. Very interesting time for the games industry. And we, you know, they didn't even get into things in this book like the, uh, the Oculus Rift. You know, I saw somebody was mentioning that uh, the other day. Uh, so that's, that could be a whole, new, you know, a whole new arena. We don't really know. It's a little early to tell. Uh, so there's a slide about blockbusters in this term. And I just wanted to do, just sort of a serendipity happen. I was listening to some lectures about the uh, movies like Gladiator, and the, they call them the swords and sandals genre. And they, this uh, genre came out in the 50s with a film called uh, Quo Vadis. Vadis? Vadis? <laughs> I'm not quite even sure how to pronounce it. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you've seen these uh, movies like Gladiator, you know, they're really, it's a really great movie, Gladiator, but apparently back in the 50s when this genre uh, come out, it was so huge and people were so excited. I mean, these movies were costing enormous, like the most expensive movies ever made. Uh, people were just going to them, just flocking to the theaters to see these things. So one of the reviewers or critics writing about this Quo Vadis movie was trying to think of an analogy, something, some kind of metaphor to describe uh, this, you know, how popular the movie was. And since it was just after World War II, uh, they had this uh, terminology called the blockbuster, which was a bomb. So the idea was these big bombs would go off and like destroy an entire neighborhood or whole city block. And so that was the analogy that this reviewer came up with <laughs> to describe the uh, impact that uh, Quo Vadis was having. So I just thought that was a little fun tidbit for you. So when you see this term blockbuster, uh, you can remember that it has something to do with the swords and sandals movies and these uh, huge bombs that were being dropped in War World War II. All right, anyway, uh, the blockbuster model dominates in book publishing or uh, in movies again, come back to movies. Uh, the idea is that there's a lot of movies, most movies, most novels, most video games don't do all that well. They might actually just break even or actually lose money. Most of it loses money. See, 90% of revenue generated is only by 10% of the titles. Uh, so what this means is book publishers, they, they tend to cast a wide net. You know, they want to publish a lot of different novels or make a lot of different games in hopes that, you know, one of those games will take off and do really well and that will carry the, you know, make up the difference from all the underperforming titles. Uh, so that's a, a model, as you can see, why that might be problematic. You know, it would be a lot nicer if there was a way that the publishers wouldn't have to publish all those underperforming games, right? And just only publish ones that would do well. But of course, that's the nut that <laughs> may never be cracked. It's just nobody can predict, like, what? who would have thought something like Minecraft or Angry Birds would be these, these huge phenomena? Nobody saw that coming. Uh, if you do read my books, Either that console's one or the other, uh, something like this, uh, Vintage Games 2.0. You know, I'm just trying to sell you these things. You can get them from the library. Uh, but one of the things is that they, we see time and time again, the publishers don't know that they have a hit on their hands. Uh, so we talked in here about Pac-Man, for example, and SimCity is one that got, that got brought up in our textbook. But there's plenty more, The Sims, for that matter. And it was so hard for them to find a publisher because they these games were too weird. You know, they thought these are going to be flops. We don't even want to publish these things. They passed on the rights. <laughs> you know, and of course they end up being the dominant games of the of the year, if not a whole decade. So this goes to show you uh, there is a random factor. Uh, here's a chapter, or here's a graphic rather, about the breakdown of the profits that is, is made from a console game. And again, just thinking about games like the Call of Duties. Uh, somebody had a funny post the other day. It was like Call of Duty the American Kenning. <laughs> the Americaning or something. Thought that was fun. Uh, but yeah, think, thinking about these big games, it might get a lot of uh, attention in the mainstream media. 
So you, you, you plunk down, like Assassin's Creed, uh, so you plunk down 60 bucks for this disc, or probably more likely you're buying it online somewhere these days. So you wonder, okay, who gets the 60 bucks? You know, how is that $60 broken up? And so the book gives us some good info here, and I put it onto this, uh, this uh, pie chart for you. So you can see the console maker here gets a, I think this is a, what, a 12% slice? I should have written that <laughs> down. <laughs> I don't see my percentages here anymore. Uh, but you could see the console makers and the retailers, you know, your Walmarts or GameStops, uh, they, they get about an equal size of the slice. And then this other slice over here that looks sort of a little bit like a really uh, a Pac-Man at the extreme <laughs> range of his, uh, uh, of his eating motion. Uh, the publishers, developers, and distributors all slice up this. You know, there's some other slices I could add in there. You know, a lot of times a game is not based on, or a game is based on something else, uh, like Lord of the Rings, or you know, any game based on a movie. There's some kind of tie-in like that. There'll be a slice that will go to the, or any of, any of the games based on Wizards, Wizards of the Coast products. Uh, any kind of Dungeons and Dragons game, for example, or Magic the Gathering game. There's another slice that goes to the owner uh, of that IP, so you could take that <laughs> away as well. And this gives you some sense, I think. You know, typically by the time it gets down to the uh, developer, you might only be getting a, you know, 10% of that 60 bucks. So maybe you get like $10 out of that. And you know, if you think about this huge slice, I think what's significant about this this chart here is really that. You know, look how big these slices are that, you know, the, the console maker and the retailers really have nothing to do with making that game. But, you know, look how big of a chunk they get. So this is the reason, this is the reason here why the software or the game developers are so interested in getting away from consoles, you know, taking it to Steam, getting away from that model, uh, some of the free, uh, free handhelds and this sort of thing. And also why they're so fascinated by digital distribution, and they want you don't go to don't buy your game from Walmart or Amazon. Uh, they want you to buy it from the Xbox Xbox's own built-in store, right? Nintendo had something similar with their, you know, the Nintendo Store. I forget what they call their their store, uh, but basically that's a way to bypass the GameStops and the WalMarts, uh, so they they can recoup more of their money. All right, so here's a second question for you. Uh, how many games have you bought over the past year, past 12 months, since I don't know when you'll be watching this? Uh, so how much did you pay for those games? You know, you don't have to be exact. Are you Basically what I want to know is are you paying full price, the 60 bucks, or are you uh, waiting for discounts or buying a value and budget titles only? And then I'm also curious, have you paid for anything beyond just the game? So, for example, an in-game item, <laughs> a fancy hat, uh, or maybe some type of uh, extra weapon or costume, whatever the case may be. Uh, or maybe something physical, some kind of merchandise, a t-shirt, a poster, uh, a keychain, you know, anything like that I would like to know. Okay, so moving on a little further we get to this idea of how much does it cost to make a game and they say that the AAA games I think this book is a few years old now but they're saying it's creeping upwards of 60 million you know I forget what I said last time uh, but I think that's probably somewhere in that ballpark uh, but it's not getting any cheaper <laughs> and so the budgets are climbing for these games uh, but they also point out that the Again, this idea that a lot of the games aren't making these huge profits. They're not blockbusters, but they're still doing okay. Now, those are the value titles, the middleware. You know, a lot of times the publishers will take an older game and sort of repackage it. You know, may, maybe improve the graphics a little bit, uh, re-release it. Basically, that could be a budget title. Uh, they might combine some games onto a single disc. So you see all that sort of stuff. Uh, but really, there's a lot of games that just don't really get a whole lot of attention. But if you do go to Walmart or GameStop, you know, you'll see a lot more games there in addition to just the, you know, the Assassin's, Assassin's Creed's of the world. So those are anywhere from a half million up to five million. And again, this we're talking about companies like Activision, uh, Electronic Arts. 
All right, so that's enough then about the, the sort of budget and the finance of it. Now let's look at the game development process itself. And they identify these four phases here uh, that I think we can go over quickly. It's mostly common sense. Uh, so the first one is just, of course, the concept stage. So you have this idea, hey, I want to do a... I want to do a side game where it's you know going sideways like this. I want to have a little bird, and you press the button, and the bird's wing, you know, the bird's uh, flaps his wings and goes up, and he's trying to duck, you know, dodge around stuff. Uh, this coming, you know, this way. Uh, so you have a concept like that, and you pro a lot of people have concepts for games. I think this is the first thing I should point out in this course. You know, a lot of people think it's really exciting. Oh my God, I have an idea for a video game. And they think everybody should be really excited about <laughs> you know, their idea. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, this is like the easy part. You know, everybody's got ideas. It's no big deal if you have an idea for a video game. Uh, it's just a concept at that point. There's no more work that's been done, right? Uh, so that's the first phase. I mean, I guess it, I guess even at that stage, if you heard somebody talk about their concept, and you said you could probably tell, well, that's not really going to work. Uh, you know, maybe the maybe it should be going up and down instead of the side to side or whatever. Uh, you know, maybe that could get rooted out. But probably what's going to happen is the problems will emerge in this next phase, which is really where I think the work begins. It's when you actually get down to designing. So you're taking it just from this idea, this concept, into a really what's called a document or design document usually. Uh, this is where you're really getting into like the nitty gritty of how this will work. Okay, so you say the button, you know, things like you press the button, the bird flaps its wings. About how high does it go, right? And how, what kind of obstacles are you talking about coming this way? And uh, will it be like a cutesy thing, a cartoony thing? Uh, will it be <laughs> gritty? Uh, you know, what, all those sorts of questions. You know, when you get into something like uh, a Final Fantasy game or a role-playing game, uh, then there's all these other design questions. You know, what kind of, are you going to have levels? How many levels will you have? How, how much will it take to level up? You say, well, you want to have all these different weapons in your game. What will each weapon look like? What will it do? Uh, how many enemies are you going to have in the game? Uh, all the way up to like, you know, let's make have the map of the world you're creating and the different regions, <laughs> different dungeons. I mean, it goes on and on. So you can see how that's a lot more work than just saying, oh, I got this idea uh, for a role-playing game. You know who it doesn't really it's not going to impress anybody unless you have a solid design and have really thought through like all the little uh, minutia uh, so that's all just kind of you know pre-production stuff uh, then we get into the production proper and they talked about some ways to go about that we'll delve more into this but you know again this is where I think you'd really if you really want to get a career in the games industry I think you need to step through all these all these uh, processes yourself at least once and it's kind of what I'm doing in this class with this twine project just so you can have some experience going through yeah you got an idea that's fine but let's see if you could turn it into a design okay let's see if you could turn that and actually make a working game that's the production uh, and then out to the testing which is basically the editing uh, the revising uh, making sure everything works uh, and all four of these phases are really important in game design, uh, and you'll learn. We'll learn more about this as as we go along. But you know, suffice it to say, you probably already picked up on this theme of mine is that you know it's great to have an idea for a game, but you can't stop there. You know, that's just the very uh, first step. Uh, the, what's really going to matter is whether you can get it through this design, whether you can create a prototype and get it out uh, for people to play. All right, and there's just some technical terms. You know, you never know. I, I don't have any idea whether you are somebody who is a hardcore gamer. <laughs> it's just like yawning. <laughs> Knows all this stuff already. Uh, or, you know, maybe you're brand new and you just want to learn. Like, this is why you're in the class. You want to learn this stuff. Uh, so I think it's nice to slow down and define some terms. Now, I think I've already mentioned this one, design document. Uh, but basically, this is kind of like a very detailed outline it's kind of a way I would I think about this, where you really again get into the nitty gritty. Like, what's the big picture of your game? But if it's like you know if it's a role playing game again, uh, what kind of classes are you going to have? Uh, how will the combats be handled? What are the enemies? How many 
dungeons are you going to have? So all these sort of, everything sort of laid out there, planned out, the sort of massive outline. And the reason for doing that is it's if you have a problem with the design document, all you have to do is highlight and cut it <laughs> and write some more down, right? You change the text. It's a lot easier to rewrite a description of something uh, than it is to have a actual actually have an artist design this 3D model for you, fully rigged, animated thing, and then say, you know what, I decided I, I don't want that. <laughs> I want this other thing. <laughs> uh, you know, that you just wasted thousands of dollars with that, uh, whereas just cutting a little piece of a document and rewriting it, you know, that's practically free. Uh, so you can see why the there's a lot of emphasis on the, the document. You know, make it make it clear. We want to know what your full plan is. We want to know everything uh, that you have in mind so we can, you know, read read through this, decide if it's something we, we can do, uh, how feasible it is, etc. So that's all part of this design document process. Uh, the Let's see, the game engine, uh, this is a term that gets thrown around a lot. So basically what they're talking about there is usually when you're writing a game, you don't just start from scratch, you know, with just looking at a blank, you know, writing all your own uh, C sharp, <laughs> C++ code or whatever it is for things like handling graphics, making windows appear on the screen, handling input, uh, working with animation. You know, that's way beyond anybody's capability, uh, especially, I mean, even the big, even these big studios we're talking about, uh, unless you are the, you know, part of this Unreal Engine, uh, then you're probably just licensing that engine and building upon it. Uh, so, for example, we'll be using this Twine uh, game engine. So when you use Twine, all you really have to know is how do I make the game? You know, how do I make rooms? How do I make the trees and the logic behind that work with variables? You don't have to answer fundamental questions like how do I make the text appear on the screen? Uh, that's all handled through uh, Twine. And same thing with something like Unity. I mean, it's 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 amazing when you, the stuff you can do with Unity uh, because they have they've done all the heavy lifting for you. So basically, I just say. I want a little rat guy <laughs> to appear on the screen. I want him running around. You know, I can do that in just a you know a few minutes. Uh, versus if I had to actually sit down and like create scripts for how to handle the animation and rigging systems, and you know, you'd be there for decades. Uh, so that's the game engine. Uh, the demo version. You hear you're talking about a demo. Uh, some people call them playable demos. Some, <clears throat> some people just call them prototypes. And that just means, uh, you know, if I'm trying to make a game like, uh, I'll say, uh, the Flappy Bird or Angry Birds or something, instead of making that full game, uh, you could just make like one level or just like one screen for Angry Birds, you know, just to give you an idea of like what kind of game this is, how it works. And they're used a lot in professional game development as a way, you know, maybe if you're doing Kickstarter. You could say, here's a prototype of the game. You could play this. If you like this concept, you know, pledge to my Kickstarter, and then we can make the full game. Uh, but the idea is they need to see enough of your idea. They need to get, a, you know, the look and feel uh, of the project before they're willing to commit to the project. So that's this idea of a demo version. Uh, it's just basically you take one part of it and finalize it. And then you'll hear about alpha beta, or this game is in alpha, this game is in beta, or this is the gold master. You might hear sometimes they'll say, this the game went to master, or the game went gold on such and such a date. And so what they're talking about there is basic, basically what I call rough drafts. You know, writing class, you have a rough draft of a paper, and that's kind of like the alpha. You know, it's sort of good enough, it's sort of done, but you know it's not ready for prime time. Uh, so you don't really show anybody this. Uh, that's in game terms. This would be like a rough draft that's just kind of passed around the studio. Uh, you know, people are looking at it and trying to make make it better. Uh, the beta one is where it's it's good enough to start sending out to external people, reviewers, testers, more like uh, beta testers they call them. And these are people that get paid to basically uh, screw around. <laughs> you know, they, they intentionally try to break your game. Uh, so if a good beta tester, they're going to be doing all the crazy stuff you're not supposed to do that no sane person would do. You know, they're going to go into the areas they're not supposed to go to. They're going to try to use weird combinations of weapons and 
uh, just basically do crazy stuff to see if they can glitch out your game and bug it out so it crashes because uh, that will let the, you you know hey there's a there's some kind of problem with the code there or I didn't think about this you know these players are doing this crazy thing I didn't uh, factor that in so I need to go back and, and fix that and so that's all part of the beta testing uh, and then the gold master, I guess this is a term that goes back to the recording industry, but that's when it's done, it's out, it's in the stores. I do think they raised a good point in this book about how that's really not done. That concept doesn't really work anymore because even once a game is out and you buy it, chances are there will be a patch released or an update. So the team never, it's, it's like, when, do you, when are you ever done with this game? Because it could be years later and you're still making these little patches, fixing bugs, uh, things of that sort. And it's kind of expected that, that you get that for at least a few months, if not a year or more. Uh, you know, it's a patch basically just means there was some kind of error that people, they didn't know about until after people started to report it, the people that bought the game. So then they rush out this little code that you can use to uh, uh, basically fix your game. And then we have these roles in game development. So here's where I want you to think, you know, where might you fit in here? And I think it's a good idea, especially if you're real serious about a career in the games industry, to get some experience with every single one of these areas. You know, each one has its own challenges and its own rewards, uh, shall we say. Uh, a lot of, you know, of course, in a professional context, you probably wouldn't be doing all this yourself, but... There are people out there that are just, you know, one uh, one person shops, or very small teams. But anyway, let's just kind of go through these. Uh, so most people think first and foremost about the game designer, and they say, "What do you want to do? I want to be a game designer." Uh, what do you mean by that? And they they sort of, somewhat like a movie director. You know, you're the person that's writing that design document. Uh, you are right, probably writing the story of the game, thinking about the levels. Uh, thinking about what type of game it'll be, uh, what what makes it what'll make it this your game different than all these other games, uh, all the way down to like little minutia, uh, and then they say in a bigger game you might have uh, different types or different tiers of designers. So you might have an interface designer, uh, so maybe you're just like looking at the you know the, the way the windows look when you pop up and you know what how do you scroll through the inventory, you know all that sort of stuff. Uh, I talked to a woman maybe just a few weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago, uh, named Annie Vandermeer. And she had worked on the games uh, Neverwinter Nights 2. And her job, starting there at Obsidian, was just as an item designer. Uh, so she went, she basically created items for this, these role-playing games, the different swords, the different axes, and different kinds of armor. <laughs> and she had to write, like, this, you know, descriptions of it. And I guess the maybe work on the stats, like how powerful would the item be. Uh, but that you know gets you some sense of the scope of this industry. Like that was her full-time job, just doing items. And you know, of course, she had designers over her that you know made sure that whatever she came up with fit with the rest of that. Uh, and then of course a dialogue, you know. So I, I kind of put designers and writers. You know, I kind of lump them together, but some studios might have a different team called writers. And maybe some of those just do, like, the, the dialogue. Uh, okay, so moving on then to the artists. And that one's kind of self-explanatory. I mean, you know what an artist does. Uh, they, it is important, I think, to keep in mind, though, that there's 3D artists who basically make models. And they work with a tool called Maya. Uh, there's another one called 3DS Max. Uh, or Blender is a free one uh, that some artists use. But, you know, if you like sculpting, uh, you would probably really like this because they do, you know, it's a 3D model, but then they also work on, and again, sometimes this would be a whole different department, but animation and rigging. Uh, so you have the dinosaur, right, and you want to make the, figure out the bones of the dinosaur so it can move realistically uh, and all that sort of stuff. And, I mean, you might have a team of hundreds of artists, and some of the, some of these artists might be just working on like particles, <laughs> or like blood splatter, uh, decals, and things. Uh, maybe some are just doing the textures, or sort of the stuff that's laid over the uh, the model. But anyway, basically, it comes back to having a good eye and being artistic. Uh, and then the 2D artists, two dimensional, so they're working on things like maybe backgrounds 
or uh, the interface art. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of course, it may be a 2D game. I think we mentioned, um, well, like Angry Birds, I think, or uh, Flappy Birds. So if it's not a 3D game, then they design sprites, uh, which just means a little flat image. And that's animated. The sprites are animated like the old uh, cartoons, the old cell cartoons. So they had to have little little pictures for like each movement of his leg, <laughs> of the character's leg, you know, slowly walking across. And so there's a slightly different skill set. And I know people that love the 2D stuff, you know, they really get into this, they love that sort of old-fashioned um, art. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to look unrealistic. You know, the 2D art could be, well, just like cartoons, you know, some cartoons are very realistic and detailed. But, you know, it's a very different world than the 3D world. All right, moving on then to audio, and they didn't put this one in the book, but I'm I like, what the heck? Now, audio plays a huge role uh, in games. Uh, somebody was asking me about this. Now, I have talked to some sound people, uh, some you know fairly influential people in the game audio world. The the Fat Man is uh, he had a studio called Team Fat. It was really instrumental in uh, the early game audio. He's so key because he was he was a part of the industry when it was moving from floppy disks and game cartridges to the CD-ROM. And one of the big deals about that was with the CD-ROM, suddenly you could have audio that wasn't just like bleeps and bloops. <laughs> but, you know, you could actually have recordings of real musicians playing and put those into the game. Uh, he worked on one called The Seventh Guest. It was a big hit back then, largely because of this. Uh, but that's a whole other world. It is true that a lot of game developers do just, or game studios, just pay, you know, professional musicians to record music, and then they put it into the game. Uh, but you also have things like sound effects, and especially if you're getting into, like, uh, uh, Oculus Rift and three-dimensional space, you know, uh, spatial uh, sound uh, plays a big role, even in terms of the interface, the, the sounds it makes when you press buttons and stuff. <laughs> Uh, all part of the audio world. It does get a little uh, short shrifted, I think, but I think it's important. Uh, of course, the programming is an obvious thing, and in a lot of classes like this, the teacher will say, well, you know, you don't really need to know programming anymore, and we do have tools like Game Maker, Unity, Twine. Now, I disagree with that. You know, I think it's really useful for anybody calling themselves a game designer to at least know, like, how to make a, a simple game in uh, C Sharp or Python or Java. You know, it's not that hard. <laughs> or Game Maker has a write up language. Mark, I uh, forget what they call that. Markup language or Game Maker language scripting. Anyway, uh, it's not that hard to pick up the rudiments of programming and be really useful. And, you know, plus this is something where if you do know how to program, you just, just a little bit of knowledge, you can do so much with it. You know, it's, it's well worth the time. You know, if you are interested in the... I don't know how much we'll get into it in this class, but there are some uh, videos on YouTube by Brackies. B-R-A-C-K-E-Y-S. So look at Brackies uh, C-sharp tutorials, and maybe, you know, maybe a few hours dedicate to that, and you'll already have picked up some really powerful, powerful, powerful <laughs> programming techniques. Uh, let's see, project management, production, you know, so this is probably not the entry-level job, right? This would be somebody who's gone through all these other phases for a while, or somebody maybe from a business background. Uh, I have talked to game producers, various companies. Uh, a lot, Some of these folks do know the games industry inside and out. And then other ones, though, they might be coming from an entirely different industry. Uh, the infamous example is Atari. Uh, when they, when Nolan Bushnell, who founded Atari, left to go do his Chuck E. Cheese nonsense, uh, he was replaced by this guy named Ray Cassar. And I think Cassar's experience, if I recall correctly, was selling towels. <laughs> it's like a, you know, the towel business, towel industry. And so how do you go from that to games? And really, he didn't know anything about games, but he did know a lot about, like, well, here's how to keep a budget. Uh, here's how to uh, work a organizational chart and all this stuff, uh, but nowadays you know the, you still need somebody like this. When all the designers and you know everybody's arguing, uh, you need somebody to be able to make the decisions. 
Uh, you need to be able to coordinate, you know, make sure that the artists are talking to the designers and the programmers know what's going on. So you're really facilitating a lot of that stuff. You're also working maybe with the publisher, uh, if there's a publisher, or handling a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, so there's a lot that goes on there in the production role. You know, typically what you'll see happening, or at least what I've seen happen, is somebody will start off maybe testing. Let me just skip ahead and then I'll walk you through the steps. <laughs> All right, so the testing, we talked a little bit about this already. So this would be the either the beta testers or the in-house testers. So they're going through your game, going through this game, trying to find bugs, seeing what works, uh, seeing where there needs to be some touch-ups. Uh, basically just putting it through its paces to see if they can crash it is usually the goal. And you think, well, that sounds like a fun job. Well, maybe, uh, but you're not really playing the game for fun. What you're really doing is you're re genuinely trying to break the game, and you're keeping very careful notes and logs so that you can, when you report back, you could say, okay, this I did this series of steps, and it crashed. And here's what, you know, here's exactly what I did, so you can try it and reproduce reproduce that error and fix it in the code. And that's what the testers do. Uh, so on the one hand, it does give you a lot of experience. You really see all sides of a game, including the stuff that most people never see, because you probably don't play like every possible character combination, uh, every possible weapon configuration. I mean, they're really trying to see every possibility and even with armies of these testers, you're not going to be able to catch everything. Uh, but anyway, typically, now that I've sort of gone through the roles, uh, so you might start off here in the testing. You know, it's typically where it's easiest to get your foot in the door. And then if you're really good at testing, uh, then you might move into one of these other roles, some kind of assistant, uh, some kind of low-level designer. Maybe, you, maybe you're the person doing the items, <laughs> writing item descriptions, just kind of whatever you can uh, get a handle on. Uh, or if you do have skills in these other areas, uh, you know, programming, that kind of speaks for itself. If, if you're really really a hot programmer, uh, I don't see why you shouldn't be working. <laughs> there seems to be always some demand for this. Uh, usually the folks that are struggling uh, for work, you might, once you get into like art, especially if you're doing uh, uh, the 2D art maybe, or the 3D art, and then you got a fairly specialized skill set as well. Uh, you know, the problem is your, the competition, right? You're competing with all these other artists all over the world. And I guess the same is uh, true for programming. Yeah, but there's certainly, you really have to be good, you know, if you want to work for one of these big companies, uh, you know, at least at the lead level. Uh, and the designers, I don't think you, you know, it's, it's hard to get to like a lead designer position coming out of a, a college program, right? You'd, you'd probably have to start off you know, as I said, go through these various stages and maybe uh, start off as some kind of item designer or dialogue designer first. Uh, okay, so we covered a lot here. Um, I'll end it here. Uh, thank you for watching, obviously. Uh, but please, I do ask a question. Uh, make a comment about this lecture. Let me know what you're thinking, and I'll see you next time.